Andrew Poole and Rose Ray Pye in Denver four years ago. Yeah. So, so first we're going to just give a quick intro to Ansible because, um, like I said, some, some people here are newer to it. We'll run through what it is, what it does, that kind of thing. Uh, and then we're going to put Drupal 8 on this cluster of Raspberry Pis, uh, and then we'll get into discussion. And at that point, I want to, like, it'd be great to hear what other people are doing because these are some of the fun things I've been doing, uh, some of the things I've been doing for testing and stuff. But um, anyway, so Ansible is what I called last year at DrupalCon, and this year I was I submitted a session, didn't get it approved, but basically I'm calling it configuration management for humans. It's like it's it's the new evolution of a lot of the older configuration management tools. To me, they seem more programmer oriented or uh, more specific. Like you have to have knowledge of the tool to get into it. Uh, whereas Ansible is more approachable. You can jump in, and within an afternoon, you can get a server automated, or you can get your local environment automated. Uh, or if you're just using it for server management, you can do that. And part of the reason for that is that it uses SSH for its transport, so you don't have to install it on all your servers. You don't have to do any special setup. You don't have to have a pre-script that runs before you run your configuration management. You just install Ansible on your server or on your, your uh, local machine and, and go from there. Uh, and Basically, as I say in the last point, is you don't need a configuration management tool to manage your configuration management tool with Ansible. It does everything from provisioning to configuring uh, to orchestrating containers, whatever kind of thing you're doing. Um, and just a really brief overview of how to use Ansible. Uh, it's similar to other CM tools where you have, in Ansible, it's called an inventory. You give it a list of your servers. And this can be a hard-coded list, like I have these three servers, and I call them my web server group. Or I have one server, and it's called my, uh, my whatever server. Uh, so you have to describe Ansible your servers. You can do that hard-coded or use dynamic scripts with AWS or whatever other tools you want. Uh, and then Ansible lets you run ad hoc commands. Basically, you use that inventory and say, Ansible run this command on all these servers or on this specific group of servers, that kind of thing. So if you're doing things like rebooting your servers or you want to do a rolling reboot where you reboot it, uh, groups of them at a time, you can do that kind of thing with an ad hoc command immediately, fires it off from your computer to all those. Uh, and then finally, the bread and butter is playbooks where you code your infrastructure. So playbooks let you take what you would do in a shell script or in a puppet, uh, uh, whatever puppets things are. Um, and then you put you put that into code, and you can check that in your code base, or manage it separately, that kind of thing. Um, and it it lets you ensure that your servers are in a certain state. Uh, so that's that's basically Ansible. You describe your servers, you can run commands on them, or you can run playbooks on them. Uh, and to demonstrate that, I for for a lot of these presentations that I was giving over the past couple of years, I've been doing it on a set of VMs on my computer, but it's not very real. Like, it, people don't understand, like, oh, I have six VMs, and here's how Ansible is communicating with them. So I built this uh, cluster of Raspberry Pis, because I'm more of a visual person, and it was a lot easier to see, like, oh, so that's what Ansible is doing, and that's when it's doing it. Um, so this is a cluster of six Raspberry Pi 2s with a little uh, board on the GPIO pins uh, with a RGB LED on each one, so you can see status of what happens. And all this network together with a with a gigabit switch, although the Pi's themselves are 100 megabits, so uh, that's one of the main bottlenecks of it. Um, and uh, for those, anyone who is at MidCamp, I have an upgrade. Now the case, instead of being a little toolbox that was like falling apart, it's, I went to MCM Electronics and bought a nice cool tactical case. I call it the football. So, um, and also, if you take a picture of it, don't use a flash, because it's the Pi 2, you know, yeah. they'll die. <laughs> so, <laughs> I tried it out, and it does work. Just take a camera flash, flash it, and they all shut down. So that's no good. But, uh, but anyway, so what's that? Wait, I haven't, I haven't done that. I actually ordered the little rubber. You can order a rubber compound and stick it on one of the chips, and it solves that. But you know, anyway, the rubber hasn't come to me yet. All of this is a dye. It's literally a silicon dye that they just solder straight to the board. Yeah. And it doesn't have the protective coating or whatever that yeah, it needed, so, so. It flips bits when you're yeah. pressing this flash. And it doesn't, it doesn't end well. Um, so, so I'm going to run a couple commands to control those LEDs uh, from my Mac using ad hoc commands. 
Uh, and this is, again, ad hoc is just Ansible throws a command at the server uh, through, <coughs> through the SSH connection. Um, so if I, oops, if I just run back. So, do, do, do. so I'm just going to do this command on the web servers. On this setup, I have, uh, this will be our load balancer on the top. And then there's four web servers that will be running Drupal 8. And then there will be a, a database server. So I'm just going to run this on uh, the web servers. So you have Ansible as the command, and then you give it a group, uh, or you can say all for all of them. Uh, and then you give it an argument, and the default module just runs that command. So I have a little script on there called RGB that sets the color. And it should, if it works, it should turn them red. <laughs> See? So and it, it did that all instantaneously. Well, I mean, the first time you connect, it takes a second. So if I go to like RGB blue, it should be a lot quicker this time. Because uh, the first connection, Ansible uses pipelining and uh, uh, control persist. So the first time it connects for a task, it'll take like a second or two to connect to the servers. But after that, commands just fly. So that's one reason Ansible is so fast, even if you have dozens or hundreds of servers. Um, but we can, we can do other things too, like, uh, let's see, I had... Um, so by default, Ansible is set to run commands on five servers at a time, but you can say, uh, if I go back to red, or if I go back to green. So if I wanted to uh, run the command on all six, and let's go to red and do it on all. If I want to run the command on all six, you can pass in the forks parameter and uh, give it, like I can give it six forks, and it should run it, and it should be, well, it's taking its time to connect to the other ones. So it'll take a second, there it goes. And so I can turn them back to green again. And now they're all back to green. But if I turn forks down, what that is telling Ansible to do is just do the command one on one process at a time. So if I go to forks one, it should start at the top and start going down. Oh, I just turned them green. That's silly. So if I turn them red, you'll see. So it should start at the top and go down. And now the Ansible is hitting each server individually. And then, and I'll get to the point of this in a minute. Uh, so if I want to turn them back green, and if I go to forks equals three, it should do the top three, then the bottom three, which it does. And so the, the usefulness of that is it's simple to tell Ansible, uh, this is on the command line, but if you're doing a playbook, you can tell Ansible, batch this command or this playbook or set of tasks to two servers at a time or eight servers at a time. <coughs> so if you have infrastructure with 24 servers and you want to have a zero downtime deployment of something or a zero downtime update, you can run the command uh, it'll take the take those servers out of your load balancer, run the stuff on them, and then if that passes, go to the next set, and you can control that very easily uh, using serial and forks. Yeah. Uh, this is a basic question. Uh -huh. Totally new to Ansible, but you mentioned, I understand that you say that you can define your groups, and so I see that you, you're using your web servers, you're using all, and I can see that it's going out to your 10 dot, <coughs> dot, 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 so you've got your own little uh, network set up there. Where I'm, so I'm assuming that somewhere in Ansible, you've made that connection that it knows that like this thing pings these IP addresses, yeah. right? So yeah, when you're so saying your Ansible do this or do that to these things, it still has to go to some config file to know like, oh, yeah. what he means by that is go to these IP addresses. Yeah, so in, and in this present, the, since I'm not doing a presentation, I want to like get us into discussion mode. Um, so I cut out that whole explanation of okay. how that happens, but basically... Uh, Ansible looks by default at a host file in Etsy, Ansible hosts, and uh, you can hard code a list in there, like I did if you see the join me. So that's a list. It's an INI file syntax. Um, but there's many different ways you can get your servers into Ansible. Uh, this is the simplest and quickest, but you can use dynamic inventory. You can write your own. Like for hosted Apache Solar, I have a web service that builds the inventory of all the servers for Ansible and calls it through there. So. Um, but that's that's how you do it, and that's how I can I can say like just do it on the balancer, the web servers, the database, uh, all of them, that kind of stuff. Uh, so, so that's LEDs on the Pi. That was like a week of soldering and and breadboarding to get those things to actually work well. Uh, Is that GPIO pins that yeah. You just haven't connected to. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And I have I have plans to also before this thing started, I had to set the date on all of them because they don't have a real time clock in them. Um, and that was that was another couple hours of panic the night before the mid camp presentation. And you find out that your servers are like two seconds out of sync, and then cluster dies. 
Uh, other things also die when the when the uh, timing's out of sync. So let's get back because uh, I want to keep moving on uh, to uh, playbooks, which is really uh, where a lot of the work happens here. So um, a playbook is taking those commands that you run, or taking a shell script and turning it into immutable infrastructure, uh, where you can run it once or run it a hundred times, and it'll just ensure that a certain state is matched in your infrastructure. So for instance, here's a playbook. Uh, in this playbook, it uses YAML, just like Drupal 8 uses YAML, and just like pretty much everything that does configuration is moving towards using YAML. Uh, you give it a list of tasks, and in this, in this example, there's just one uh, that's making sure PHP is installed. And you pass it a module, which is an Ansible module, kind of like a Drupal module extensible. Um, you give it a module name, in this case, apt for Ubuntu. It would be yum for uh, CentOS or D, DKT or whatever, soon for Fedora. Um, and then you give it a name of a package and a state that it should be installed or removed, that kind of thing. So that's a playbook. Um, and we're going to run a playbook to install Drupal on all these servers. And the architecture, this, is, this slide is a little out of date because it was for MidCamp. I took Redis out of the stack because in my benchmarking with Drupal 8 now, Redis actually uh, doesn't help performance at this point with the state of the Redis module in its early beta and Drupal in its early beta. Uh, so I took Redis out, and there's actually four servers. Uh, the balancer's running Nginx, and I provisioned, that, I provisioned the stack in the hotel earlier because the internet was better there than it is here. Um, and then there will be four, the four web servers are running Nginx with PHP FPM, and then Gluster as the shared file system, which uh, I debated over Gluster or NFS for it, but Gluster worked okay in this case. And then there's a database server running MySQL. Uh, and it's where the Gluster file system is supposed to No, the Gluster file system is shared. It's actually, there's uh, three replicated copies across the four web servers. Ah, okay. So, yeah, and, and that's, that's something, too, where I don't know if anybody here is too familiar with Gluster, but it, it has its own interesting uh, behaviors when you go from, like, two to three servers, three to four servers, and then four to many servers. Um, but we're going to... If you weren't using Gluster, what would you use? NFS, most likely, for this situation. I'm just sharing the files directory. That's it. Um, if I were sharing the whole Drupal code base, that's another discussion and debate that we could have for hours. Um, but uh, but we'll, we're going to deploy Drupal 8 to it really quick. Once that's done, I'll show you how that works, and uh, then we can get into discussion. Um, so I can pop over. I have a playbook here. Yeah. So if I say Ansible playbook. So I'm running this. Uh, this is going to take a few minutes because Drupal 8 is not a speed demon yet. Uh, but you, if you look closely, you'll see uh, when it starts when it starts a deployment, it'll turn the LED red just to let you know. Um, at that stage, I could also have something that like notifies people on Slack that we're doing a deployment. I could have it take that out of the load balancer uh, using Varnish or whatever, or HA proxy. But it's right now it's uh, checking out Drupal 8. It's going to install it, um, and it's getting everything ready. And in, the installation takes a couple minutes. So while it's doing that, I can pop over and show you the playbook itself. Uh, let me make this bigger. So this is the playbook that's running right now. And uh, <clears throat> and as I said, it, like the first step is it, uh, it runs that same script that I was running earlier. It, it turns the RGB LED red uh, when it starts. And then at the end of the process, uh, it, it turns it back green. So when this is finished installing Drupal, the first one will turn green. And then it'll start deploying to the next one. Um, and then <clears throat> there's a series of included uh, playbooks, uh, or in this case, task lists inside a playbook. So if we look at one of them, like, uh, let's take a look at install.yaml, uh, which is running right now, taking its merry time installing Drupal 8. Uh, if we look at this one, it runs uh, drush si to install the site, uh, and we pass it some variables. And uh, another cool thing about Ansible is it uses Jinja 2 for its templating syntax. And Jinja 2 is the ancestor and kind of the inspiration behind Twig. So if you're working in Drupal 8 and you're working in Ansible, your knowledge of the templating system, Twig and, uh, and Jinja 2, is pretty transferable. Uh, the same, like you can use filters with it and you can print the variables the same way. Uh, and in, in addition, Drupal 8's using YAML for like everything now. And uh, Ansible uses YAML for everything. So the, the syntax and everything uh, works out pretty well. 
Uh, so anyway, it, it installs it with Drush SI. Um, oh, it finished? That's nice. All right, so now it should go to the second one. I hope. There it goes. And then uh, it'll continue down. When it gets to the fourth one, let me know if I'm still talking. Um, and it, It's installing Drupal on each one separately? Well, it's... it's uh, so just the packages. Well, so the first thing that it does on the first one is it, it checks out the code base. In this case, I'm since I'm on a local network, I have just a Drupal 8 repository locally. Don't want to do it over the network. Never use conference Wi-Fi for a presentation. Um, but then on the first one, so where is that? Uh, yeah, so, so here I have a win condition on this task to install Drupal. And so it will only install Drupal if it's on the first web server, since it does the interaction with database. Yeah, it's already kind of down to oh, the next one. Uh-oh. So. i got to hurry up. Um, <laughs> so, then, so then, and it also does some of these other install tasks only on the first one. But then other tasks, like this doesn't have a condition on it, so it's going to set the permissions on each of the servers. So each of the servers gets a check out of the code base. The first one runs the install. Um, and that's that's a similar pattern like when you're running cron jobs and things. It, it depends on how you want to deploy, but uh, in this sure, case... I just, I just thought the GFS, GFS meant it had the same... But you're just using well, it for I'm files. just using it for files, I yeah, because the performance okay. is abysmal on these pies. Right. The pies have two <laughs> huge uh, constraints. One is the 1000 networking is really slow. You can actually do gigabit, but it only gets up to 200 megabits because of the bus. Uh, and then the, the micro SD card is incredibly slow. Even if you get a nice fast one, uh, the, the constraint is the, the buses inside. So hopefully the BeagleBone's better, but the BeagleBone's twice as expensive. And I'm not going to pay like 800 bucks <laughs> for a demo, you know. Um, so anyway, it looks, is it finished? No. Yeah. Oh, all right. So it's finished. Uh, we can talk more about this later if we get time. But um, at this point, if it's finished, yeah, so when it finishes, it gives you a report of everything. And if I run this again, too, I'll let it run again. Um, it should go through and show nothing's changed. Like we're in a good state, everything's installed. Um, and it, uh, so if you're doing like continuous deployment, uh, continuous integration, you can have your playbooks run and make sure your servers are in the right state, which is nice. Um, and it's simple to do. Uh oh, one of the directories had the wrong permission. Yeah. So if I go to pydramble.com, which is pointing at the load balancer on the top, and then it should start running. It should uh, load up Drupal 8 now. <coughs> and again, Drupal 8 is not a, not very speedy. Oh, here it is. So this is the minimal. What's that? Uh, well, you can't. I'm on a local network here, so you'd have to hack my computer and then from my computer. <laughs> I don't encourage you. To. Well, yeah, don't don't get out of Flash, please. So, so now we're on we're on it, and uh, let's see what is. Um, so if I go over here and say curl. Uh, let's see. <coughs> so if I do this, um, you're seeing curl running and giving me the header of the backend server. So it's it it is balancing the requests. And if you if you look closely, when I do this, you should see like one of them lights up a tiny bit more. It's kind of hard to see in here, but um, but so it, it's balancing the request. Drupal serving it. We're getting the login screen. Uh, and let's say our esteemed developers now have a new new release of our Drupal site that's much more pretty than this. Uh, we can, uh, let's see, where's the presentation? Uh, so I can grab this and it's 1.2.1, right? Yeah. So I have this new, whoops, I have this new version of Drupal. And if you're doing this on in the real world, you'd want to put this variable into your variable configuration so that when you run it on a deployment server or something, you don't have to specify command line options. Uh, but for this demo, I'm just passing in the variable like we were on 1.2.0, now we're on 1.2.1, which is Drupal 8 beta 10 with a very beautiful new home page. Uh, so while that's deploying, um, uh, while that's deploying, I'll pop back over here. At, at this point, um, you know, I've been talking and talking. What, any, any questions or tidbits or anything? Um, when it finishes, I'll show you the, how it looks, and then we can get into other stuff. Um, yeah. Um, how is using Ansible different than using a, a tool like, say, Shell? So there, there are certain ways that it's the same. It, you can use it the same way if you want, because Ansible does what Chef does, configuration management. Ansible has a lot more built in out of the box, though. Uh, 
it does orchestration, so it, it can it can do cross uh, cross server provisioning and uh, deployment management. So it can do it can do things like what Capistrano could do uh, with deployments, uh, which you can kind of hack in Chef, I guess. Um, it also does it, it integrates with uh, cloud providers. It has a lot of support out of the box for DigitalOcean and Lino <coughs> and AWS and all those things. So you can without downloading extra plugins or extra tooling, you can do that. And then it also lets you communicate with all your servers via ad hoc commands. Um, and it also has good support for Docker orchestration across servers too, that kind of thing. So it's it's similar, but it's I would say it's a little more, it's more like a, having a SUV than a sports car for <laughs> doing your configuration management. But it's also like having an SUV, an American SUV, versus like a Russian car from the 50s or something yeah. where you have no idea what the controls are. Yeah. It's like, Chef, the language is just well, yeah, completely yeah. different. It's, it's the kind of Ruby. I can't remember it's, which it's one's not, actually Well, it's Ruby. not a Ruby DSL, so you don't, yeah. you don't have to start learning. It's it's just a lot harder to get used to, and you can't. it's hard, a lot harder to read. Like, Ansible, so you get, any human can read it. You know. Second here. Yeah. And it's just... Grab that. I, I learned Chef way before Ansible, and it was... It was hard. I, mean, yeah. I learned Ansible in like a day, yeah. like yeah. literally a day. Yeah. It would take you hours to like go through like, getting started. And yeah, I mean, for, for me, the bottom line was I don't have to become a Ruby developer to be a really good yeah. infrastructure management person. With Chef and Puppet, I found like I have to learn Ruby. Like you can you can get some stuff going through tutorials and things, but if you really want to do it, you got to learn Ruby. With Ansible, I don't have to learn. I I know some Python, but I've never had to use Python. Like, it's all in the YAML. And, and you can use PHP to run, to write new modules for Ansible because it all communicates through JSON. So my, my uh, hosted Apache solar inventory setup, that's all just PHP through Drupal. That's, I think that's powerful. Like it, it's language agnostic because it's using JSON wait, and YAML for wait, everything. So you use a Drupal site to tell Ansible what your inventory is? Yeah. Already? That's yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Do you have snippets yeah. or something? Well, or that's actually, <laughs> I did that as part of the book, which I'll get to. All right. um, I'm, I'm working on that section in the book, and Excellent. so I was like, and I finally bit the bullet, because I, I was manually editing my list of servers, and so now it's all, and the cool thing is now that I can do that, on my Drupal site, I click new server, it provisions it in DigitalOcean, adds it to the inventory, and then it kicks off a Jenkins job to build the server with Ansible, and uh, any future updates, it'll it'll pick that up and, and go with it. So. We probably can't get into all that today, but um, but I'll tell you later. Buy my book, and I'll have that. In there. <laughs> <laughs> so back, so back, back here first. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering. I, I used to love Puppet. Um, and then, you know, they've got your recipes and everything. Yeah. But um, what are, what are the, the likes of recipes? So so uh, Puppet recipes are like Ansible roles, and I'm not going to cover those t in this little short thing, uh, but that's. A lot of people here probably um, have seen some of my roles. It seems like that's what everybody is like, oh, I use your role. Uh, a, the roles are like recipes or uh, cookbooks and chef. Um, and Ansible has Galaxy, which is the community repository for them. So there's like almost any software I've ever seen, like what, whatever it is in whatever language, there's probably a role to install it. And uh, most of them... The cool thing about it is Ansible got started recently where people really get what a role should be, what a, what a short uh, snippet should be. And so they're really, you can stick them together and they're secure because they're so short that you can audit all the code in it. And it's YAML, so you know what's going on. Yeah, Chef has, yeah. and Puppet both have a ton more just weight code, like when you're writing mm -hmm. your own cookbooks. There's so much stuff in there that it's kind of overwhelming. Yeah. Ansible. Is there anyone for like, like Ruiz in the name or like Acquia platform? Uh, that's funny you ask. Um, no, not not right now. I mean, I the funny thing is I use Ansible for some Acquia cloud stuff, uh, but it's not uh, as far as I know. Acquia uses Puppet for a lot of the backend stuff. Uh, but Ansible, another thing I've seen a lot of people do is you can use Ansible and Chef and whatever else. Like you, you or you could call Ansible from your Chef scripts. Uh, so because An Ansible can do deployment, it can do uh, provisioning, it can do just general configuration management. So Really, like some teams, you start using it for one thing, and then eventually you might start using it for other things. But if you're using Puppet or Chef already, there's no reason to rewrite everything just to use Ansible. Uh, you can use it where it fits. Uh, so this this uh, deployment has finished. We should be on 1.2.1 uh, with Drupal 8, uh, beta 10. 
So, and again, Drupal is slow, so it takes like eight seconds to load the first page load. Um, I should classify it. Drupal is slow when you're running it on a very slow Raspberry Pi. Uh, but now we have this beautiful new home page that uses this beautiful <laughs> new Drupal theme called Bartik. Um, and also, uh, with Drupal 8, it, uh, with page caching turned on and no form on the page, this is a lot faster. When I was at MidCamp, uh, the performance was worse than slow. It was abysmal. Uh, I could get like 10 requests per second on four web servers, and that was that's pretty sad. But now, uh, let's see, do I have? Yeah. So I'm I'm going to use WRK, which is like Apache Bench, but I like it a little more for its stability. Um, so I'm going to run a quick benchmark on this this stack. And So if I run this, uh, it's going to use uh, four, four threads with 24 concurrent con connections for 10 seconds and hit the servers. And if you, if you can see it, you'll see the web servers are pretty much like full steady green. That's the CPU on them. And uh, we're getting 107 requests per second. At mid-camp, I was getting 10. Uh, and that was either logged in or not logged in. And here, uh, just from beta 7 to beta 10, we're up to, well, now 178, because I guess all the caches are getting warmed up. Um, so Drupal 8 is getting so much better. And uh, so come Friday to the sprints, and we'll make it even better than that. Yes. So yeah, we're, now we're getting 175 requests per second. And this is without the load balancer. If I, uh, if I just hit the load balancer, and this is just to, to point out, like even a Raspberry Pi stack like this could serve a giant website if it's mostly anonymous traffic. So if I use a cached page through the balancer, we should at this point be just saturating the network bandwidth on the top pi. And which it is. And now we're getting 2,400 requests per second. Uh, and this is a full page load with the, the resources and everything. So, um, so it's it, you know, if you don't have some sort of reverse proxy like Varnish or Nginx. Uh, if you don't have some sort of caching layer and you have all anonymous traffic, you should do that because not only does it let you basically scale like crazy, uh, it also helps your users get their pages way faster than even Drupal's page caches. Anyway, uh, so let's see. I, I think I have a couple more slides that we can run through and then we can get back into discussion. Uh, so there was our beautiful site. It looked great. Um, <laughs> and then... Uh, and I, I, this slide actually, I changed it um, at at midcamp since Drupal was so slow. Like it, I think it took six minutes to install Drupal, and now it's down to about three minutes. So, it's a big improvement. Um, uh, at at that point, I had like Drupal eight is scalable and really slow, and now it's <laughs> almost fast because still Drupal seven is a bit faster, but uh, eight is getting there. Out of the box, it's faster with uh, uh, anonymous pages. Uh, but I, I always like benchmarking the full PHP stack because that's, you know, a lot of requests are going to need that. Uh, another note is I, for those of you who don't know, I'm writing a book. I'm just about finished. Last year's DrupalCon, my goal was to have it finished then. And this year's DrupalCon, my goal is still to have it finished, but it hasn't <laughs> happened. So maybe by next year's DrupalCon, I'll finish. But it's on LeanPub, so you can, uh, you can get it. There's a coupon code here. And I'll post these slides online later somewhere. Just look on Twitter. Um, so get that if you don't have it. There's some resources that are that you can go to. I actually, for this Raspberry Pi, I call it the Dramble. Uh, I put all the specs, all the links to all the products, like the cables and the, the switch and everything. And it's about 460 bucks or something to get literally everything here. It's For me, it's been fun to build this. And I've been building some other things, too, to do with it. And I also like set up a, a Jenkins farm for my personal projects. It's it's probably a little more expensive to do this than to just have some cloud servers somewhere, but it's a lot more fun. So, you know, and it looks cool. You have LEDs and stuff. Um, so, so I wanted to get into the rest of this time. Uh, I hate how it's like all like this isn't a lecture, you know, but everybody's facing this way. But we, I want to hear what other people are doing because, like, um, you know, I'm working on Drupal VM. That's really just for me, but other people have liked it, so I made it a little better and stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of other projects I've seen recently, like DevShop, uh, Vlad, Valkyrie, um, and there's a couple, like I think Blackmesh and some other companies are, are starting to, to use Ansible for a lot more. 
I want to hear like what are your projects, what are your pain points, and also for somebody newer to Ansible, like what are your questions, like how do I do X, Y, Z, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So uh, I got your book at last DrupalCon, and it's, it's fantastic. Thank you. It's helped me learn this really easily. Um, my pain point is what I told you this morning. For sysops, the service and stuff, it's brilliant, it's easy. Um, but for deployments, I've always used uh, Python and Fabric mm -hmm. to handle my deployments. It's been fantastic. I love it. Um, with this, when you were running your update for 1. Point whatever point 1, you know, it hit that updating database and it hangs there. And then it hits that importing configuration yeah. and it hangs. And there's a point where I get nervous and it's like, well, did this hang? Because I'm not seeing the feedback of each update happening. I, I miss that instant feedback. Yeah. I, I th anyone else that knows anything more about it can chime in. But I, I know that there's you can have an, an async task where you fire it off and then you can get updates. It doesn't give you real-time output, though, which is probably what you're looking for, mm -hmm. which I would like, too. Um, but, yeah. If you turn on the reverse mode, you get more feedback. Yeah, yeah it, it gives you that, but yeah, he's yeah. saying, like, while it's running, because, like, with Drupal 8. Also, no, no. Python is unbuffered uh, variable for environment, and it will provide you real-time results. Python unbuffered equals one. It's so you can set that, and then Ansible will clear that? Ansible will, uh, you can get Ansible to show you the buffer? Uh, not the buffer. Uh, currently, Ansible show you uh, results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, not I th in real time. But when you put Python on buffer at equals 1 before running Ansible into the <laughs> environment, oh, yeah. it will provide you all the uh, yeah. right. Yeah, but it, it's still in pipeline it through the SSH connection, right? Yeah. So, so but I, I do remember reading a discussion on Google Groups. By the way, if you want to get into Ansible and there's there's you want to find like in the Drupal community, you know, go IRC, go to your local meetup. Ansible has a lot of local meetups, and the Google Groups is a great place to ask questions. It's kind of like the Drupal answers of of Ansible. Um, there was a discussion about that, and I think somebody was working on a module in Ansible that would like pull the data through the connection and output it. So I don't remember where that was, but search it, find it, yeah. Yeah, because Ansible, like it, like, it, like, generates files to run the commands or something, and then it yeah. sends them. It's yeah. Like little scripts, scripts, and then it sends them to the server and runs them, and maybe that's why that book, the, the output doesn't get buffered. The same yeah, way. yeah, it, that is, and, and that's why it's it's a tricky problem. And it's because it's not, it's not directly running commands through SSH. It's pushing the commands through SSH and then running them on the server and then reporting back the results. So, and the, the nice thing would be if, if Drupal's, if the like, config staging and stuff in Drupal 8 was a lot quicker, this wouldn't be as much of an issue. <laughs> but it is like sometimes you fire off a command and you're like, it's been seven minutes. Why is this still going? That's Drupal, you know. So yeah. For me, I use oh. it mostly for configuration management, and I do what he says, use Fabric for my deployments. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I'll use Ansible to install all the dependencies I need, copy my configuration files up, yeah. install Drush, Composer, all that stuff installed dependencies from Composer. Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, a lot of places do, like, if, if a place is using Capistrano and they love it, and they're working with it and everything works, if you're using Fabric or whatever tools you're using, if it works for you, keep that going. You know, I, I wouldn't, like, some people say, like, because the product does this, it's kind of like Drupal. Like, because Drupal can do front-end stuff, you don't have to use Drupal. You could use something else and use Drupal as the back-end. It's the same way with Ansible. Um, I think it's just, it's awesome for infrastructure management in general. It's also great for configuration management, and it's good for deployment if your needs are pretty simple. Most of the time, mine are. But, yeah. We're starting to work with uh, Packer mm -hmm. and Ansible. Uh, yeah. We were using Fabric, or, well, probably still are, but uh, we're really moving to that because it fits our deployment model pretty yeah. well. And they're, they are la English language mm -hmm. languages, so they're, they're easy yeah. to write for. Yeah, and, and that's that brings up another interesting point. I don't know if anybody here saw on Hacker News and Michael Dehan, he's the writer of Ansible. He had a blog post uh, just a day or two ago about immutable infrastructures, the future, and containers, things like that. It's, a, it's an interesting point. Like I'm using Packer and Ansible right now to build uh, DigitalOcean so. droplet images and my local, uh, like the image I use for Drupal VM, like a minimal install of something with whatever stuff I need on it. And that's close, but it takes a while to build that. You know, it, it takes like 
20, 30 minutes to build a, a base image and then upload it, and you're dealing with 600 megabyte images. Once we get to the containerized future, um, a tool like Ansible is already doing that kind of stuff. And I think uh, at this point, Ansible still is not seamless with container management. Uh, and But I, there's nothing else that is either. There's, there's a lot of attempts. And there's some things that are like trying to do the same thing as Ansible, but similar. Like when you're talking about dozens of servers and containers, if you're not using a solution like Google, Google's uh, whatever their container Kubernetes. Farm, yeah, Kubernetes, or if you're not using AWS's cloud formation, is that the one that does their... Like if you're not using one of those tools, it, it's really tough to get everything working well. Uh, and that's like, I don't use containers in production yet because it's, it's still kind of clunky, but... Um, what I want to start using it for is for preparing the servers to host containers and things like yeah. that. Yeah. And then once, because once it's running, it's just another server, basically, mm -hmm. and then having like a separate playbook to manage that. Or I'm not sure yet. So yeah. 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 Is there any um, uh, direct integration with Vagrant, or do you use Packer? Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I use Packer to build my own base images, because I don't trust, like I don't, like a lot of people are like, oh, just download this, whatever. Same, same thing with containers. It's like, oh, just install these Docker MySQL things. It's like, well, there's like 800 lines of <laughs> configuration. I'm not going to try to read through all that. I just want to install MySQL. Um, so I build my base image, but then Ansible and Vagrant work together just as well as any of the other provisioners. And the cool thing about well, Ansible... Would be my comment. What's that? If, like, if you have multiple Vagrant VMs that you're trying to spin up with one Vagrant file, mm -hmm. and Ansible won't gather the setup information for each individual machine when you call it from the Vagrant file. You have to call Ansible separate after you bring up your Vagrant VMs. You you can the way I have it set up like uh, I had this this uh, configuration here with the six servers I have a included in the repository on GitHub. There's a Vagrant uh, setup for it and it runs Ansible as part of the Vagrant file. Uh, you have to do a couple special things to tell it like run Ansible at the end on the last server and give it groups all and then it'll run it on all the servers. So you have access to the VM information for all the machines. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you can do that. It, that that was annoying, though. It, you had to look up some weird documentation that's not really that good. Um, I should probably do a blog post I mean, on it. Googling for the answer is a dead end right now. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'll do a blog post, and then I'll get a little more SEO for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, got to be paid off somehow. Yeah, yeah. i got to pay off the rest of the, like, that new case. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Wonder Widget. Fabric, um, mm -hmm. To deploy our stuff. And I, I started using some Ansible to replace that, and I found that calling Ansible playbooks programmatically as opposed to from the command line is a bit of a headache right now. Yeah, there was there was a post, who was it? I don't remember. It wasn't somebody in the Drupal community, but somebody had a post on, oh, it was uh, Servers for Hackers, uh, the guy who runs that blog. He had a post on using Python. If, you're, if you do it in Python, all the libraries are already there, because Ansible playbook is just a Python wrapper for all it this stuff. It just doesn't work that well, like for me. Yeah. The output is weird, and it's hard to, to track what happened. Yeah, if, you, if you, you see the same stuff you if, from the command line. Yeah, well, if you use the internal <laughs> APIs, then you're working in JSON, and then you can deal with it. Like you could, I've seen a couple people wrap it in Node, which is a lot simpler. Um, so if you want to do it that way, go fully custom. I wouldn't use the Ansible playbook command anymore. I would uh, look at wrapping it with. I think there's a Node library, and I haven't seen anything for PHP, but. Uh, basically, you're rewriting the Ansible playbook <coughs> command in some other system, and it, you can you can do nice things like that. Might be how the one guy is working on that module to do uh, to do the the output real time. We use Ansible for uh, <coughs> running uh, PHP code sniffers uh, for our code bases for speeding up uh, Drupal builds for pull requests uh, within GitHub and for running the head tests. Also, we used it for spinning up Jenkins servers from every project we start. Mm -hmm. So, and for deploys, for everything. So we are the company that use only Ansible because uh, it's really good to uh, introduce it to new developers when they come to the uh, command to the team. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Previously, we used to uh, use PubFed.com uh, uh, yeah, machine, to build a new machine. It's, it's uh, uh, nothing personal, but it's a mess because of, uh, uh, I guess, every week they just run a new version and it's completely 
different. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not easy to upgrade, but the principles look like everything just work. Yeah. Is is there anybody here from the group that does dev shop or uh, yeah, I'm okay. the creator. Can you can you cuz <laughs> that's something that I I don't think a lot of people know about it. Sure. Can you give a quick spiel on it cuz I, I uh, it impressed me. Yeah, it's basically like you know, Drupal cloud hosting but open source. So it's kind of like Pantheon or Acquia but it's just it's totally open source and you can install it from a single install script which basically just installs Ansible and, and runs the playbook. Um, mm -hmm. so but it's just, I got all the same features. The host gets you put your Git repo into it, and it spins up environments for each project. Um, you know, just like basically you think of Pantheon, but it's open source. Yeah, and um, and I have links on the presentation that I'll post later. I mean, check these things out because, you know, if if you're just getting started with Ansible, or if you're wanting to do local and prod and that kind of thing, some of these projects might get you there all the way, or might yeah. get you there and you get you a port. And it does like it uses Ansible to like set up the whole server because there's just a lot of little things you need to install in packages. But mm -hmm. the future and what we're working on now is to basically have it be able to create and manage other servers just like yeah. your your system is doing now and yeah. uh, kind of be that front end for for Ansible. Because yeah, is DevShop one server right now? Like you, you can plug you in other servers, but it's still kind of clunky because okay. it's just like you know it's an open source project and we're still working on it. But mm -hmm. the idea would be that. Plugging in servers should we, DevShop <laughs> is based on Anger, and Anger should be able to provision whole servers. Yeah. Like right now, it's still like go here and follow these instructions and manually set up all these packages. Yeah, and it's kind of annoying. Uh, but we're I'm also a contributor to Anger, and so we're working with Christopher and mm -hmm. other people to try to make it like just completely seamless. Where and, you're and just adding servers, and Anger uses the playbook roles because the roles yeah. are you can set up it. You can write your own playbook. You know, very easily, and just app get install Apache and things like that. But having like standardized shared Galaxy roles, like what he's been writing, which are up to fifty four up now, 50, by the way, fifty five. <laughs> so it's, there's a reason we're all you know finding them because they're everywhere. But they're great because it's like a shared. We're all sharing the same playbook, so it's like finally this like I'm, you know. Finding that shared tool that we can actually use for infrastructure has been very hard over the years because mm -hmm. there's been so many options. Yeah. But this one is just so pretty and elegant, and uh, it's good that you're putting these roles up. So yeah. Thanks for I that. Try. I guess. But I mean, the, the cool thing is, like, it's just like a Drupal module. Uh, I, that's my closest analog. You have modules in Ansible, but modules in Ansible are more like the the back end little plugins that do. It's a module in Ansible is like a plugin in Drupal, I would say. In Drupal eight, I'm talking. Uh, a role is like what a contrib module is in Drupal, yeah. where somebody in the community maintains it. But um, you know, if if you want to work on a role for something, some sort of software package or some sort of configuration, uh, like it's it's good to try. I mean, it's just it's the same with any open source project. It's good to try to incorporate issues and and feedback from other people. Like the coolest thing about some of my roles, like the MySQL role especially, I built it just for me and had like five settings that I ever tweak really, because I don't do I don't do certain kinds of configurations. Um, and for a while, I I had never set up personally a cluster of MySQL. But when a couple people were asking like, hey, I want to do clustering with your MySQL role, you know, I. I worked on it with them, and we got it added, and and then now anybody using the role can do it. It's you know it's I like that, and any company that's starting to use Ansible, if you start doing role development or if, if you start working on customizing a role or something, feel free to send pull requests back. Like it'd be better for the whole community to benefit from a more secure configuration or a more efficient that kind of thing. Uh, and I know uh, like uh, who is it from Black Mesh? Forget who. Um, He's probably not in here, but anyway, somebody from Black Mesh has sent like eight pull requests that all made the MySQL role way more awesomer. And uh, and it, like I, I don't know faces here, but I know at least five or six of you have sent pull requests that were just like it blew my mind. Like why didn't I think of that? That's awesome. It it makes it more useful or it makes it more flexible. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, when you're stringing together a number of different rules. Um, there's, there's different places where you can put your um, variables. Like mm -hmm. There's the default folder, there's the virus folder. You yeah. can include it from somewhere else. Um, so when you're stringing together a bunch of roles, I find it really uh, tedious to go through and try to configure each of the roles uh, uh, separately. Mm -hmm. So is there a way or a best practice where you can have one configuration file that you can give to somebody and say, hey, I'll set this whole this environment, and you all set up, all you have to do is go in and, 
and set the variables for the things you want in this one file. Yeah. And then as it runs, it would read that rather than having to, you know, yep. keep constantly going back and forth between the roles and folders and changing directories and yeah. not knowing when things are after nothing, you know. Yeah, the, the, the way I approach role development is the role should be very, very lightweight on its priorities. Like, it should give some very basic defaults. If something has to be hard-coded, then why is it a variable? You know, but, but it, if it's a variable, it should be in defaults. If it's in defaults, it's overridable by anything up the chain because uh, role defaults are like the baseline. Um, so anything you can, put it into role defaults. Um, if you, um, and then that way, your playbook could include a vars file uh, that, that overrides all those. Uh, like, if you look at Drupal VM, uh, there's a config.yaml file. That file can literally override any, any variable in any role in the entire playbook of all the different roles in there. Yeah, it merges them all together. So you, when you run Ansible playbook, you can pass a single vars file with all the variables from all the roles. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you don't have to have separate vars files in each of the roles for yourself, for your own use. Yeah. You, just make your, you can make a single vars file and pass it to, to the command line. I forget the command, but for Ansible or Ansible playbook. Yeah. And it'll load that specific var file with all the variables. So like the MySQL you and have head sheet. The command line or can no, no, you can specify it in a playbook. Yeah, this file is, right, yeah, you specify in the playbook, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, yeah, in the playbook you say vars file, and then yeah. you give it the path. It's just like loading roles. And, uh, and but, but a lot of people, and this is one weird thing about, a little weird thing about Ansible, but it makes sense once you think about it. Uh, in roles, you don't want to use vars, the folder vars in a role, to put your variables unless they're supposed to be hard-coded, because those are hard to override. So if you're building a role, don't put variables in there unless you're forced to for different reasons. Uh, put them all in defaults slash main.yaml. Uh, that's where all the defaults should be that are overridable. Now, there's a special case for if, like, if you have a variable that's like different per platform or you need to, to make it dynamically based on a PHP version or something like that, uh, then that gets a little more complicated, and I have a section in the book that you can buy. Uh, but it's, it's not a two-minute conversation. But uh, but yeah, and, and there's there's a couple of blog posts too that have some good a good overview of like variable precedence and best practices for variable placement. But yeah, it include a include a file in your playbook uh, using vars file. Can you throw those links up somewhere? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna put this presentation online in one of the slides. This slide has a link to Ansible for DevOps. The documentation the documentation has a pretty good overview too. Uh, oh, and that's something I forgot to emphasize. If you're stuck, Ansible's documentation, unlike many open source projects, is ridiculously clear and good. Like that was another thing that attracted me. Every module and every option is fully documented, and uh, there are guides in the intro to Ansible and that kind of thing that really step you through. Like here's why it does this, here's why it does that. It's I I think part of the reason for that was that early on there was an initiative in Ansible. Like we need to make our documentation really clear and easy, and that like. I almost didn't write the book because of that, but then there are a lot of other things that require a little more of a deep dive or cookbook type things. But with the documentation, like you don't have to buy my book to get an Ansible, but I hope my book helps you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any QA that will like the configuration? Of yes. Of yeah, and and uh, and that's something I, I always forget to mention it because I'm using uh, Jenkins to do everything, but. Ansible makes Tower, which is uh, a product. That's how they, like, Ansible is a company and a product. It's kind of like the Red Hat, uh, a little bit like Red Hat. But uh, Tower is their for pay product. And it, you can get a free license for up to 10 servers. Anything more than that, you have to get licensing. Um, but it's, it's a Python-based project that, that is a GUI for Ansible, uh, web-based. And it, it integrates with LDAP, and it integrates with uh, Ansible works with Windows, so you can do your Windows Server deployments, that kind of stuff. It does team management. Um, it's it's pretty slick. I, I like the interface. It's easier to to use than Jenkins, but it's paid and it's not open source. So stay tuned. Dev shop. Stay tuned. <laughs> we'll see <laughs> after yeah. I publish my uh, blog post on what I'm doing. Then, uh, yeah, but but I like uh, like my UI for hosted Apache Solar is. I have a, a entity type server, and I click new server, and I type in the name and yeah. pick a data center and a size, and then that's my GUI. It, yeah. Then it builds Ansible and it, it logs it all in Jenkins. But and we're going to get into open source all that. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or, because we're already kind of recreating that, so it's like there's a lot of parallel efforts in that yeah. in that respect. So yeah, and there's like another uh, 
Boff, this guy that made a system called Cloud, like the Cloud module in Drupal, basically mm -hmm. does the same thing. It's like inter interfaces with all the APIs for all the different server providers, cloud host providers. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know him, though. Yeah. yeah, either. We'll have to connect up with them. But yeah, just go see that. Also, you want to present our session, and now we have a, based it on Jenkins user interface. We have our open source product, name is Box. We run uh, Ansible within Jenkins job. We're passing variables. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of places use Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins is easy, fast, yeah. open source. It's not necessarily the prettiest thing in the world, <laughs> yeah. but it, it's it not works. The ugliest thing no, in it's the it's, it's gotten a lot better. Like it's I remember one one point oh or something was it was just it wasn't a disaster, but it was horrible. Nowadays, it, at least it looks okay. You know, it's also it incredibly has nice uh, theme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like Pantheon, yeah, Pantheon yeah, uses look. Pantheon uses Jenkins on the back end, and like they run <coughs> hundreds of thousands of jobs. And mm -hmm. it's like Josh K's like if you don't think it can handle something, just throw anything you got at it. It's enormous. Yeah. How are we doing for time? Oh, I still got a little time. No, oh, over here. Are there any uh, Drupal specific modules that you know of? It seems like there would be uh, uses for having, say, a Drush module that ties in making some of the Drush things. So there. Yeah, the, I actually was working on a Drush module at one point, and I, I probably have the code somewhere, but I kind of stopped doing that. I don't remember why. So yeah, no, I need that too. <laughs> so let's sprint on that. And yeah, seriously. Yeah, because that, that that would be nice to uh, Drush and Drupal console to um, figure out a way to kind of do both. But yeah, it's almost the same thing though. It's just having the command using the command module. It, it would be like. You move one word over, basically. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's a wrapper so, uh, for it, but yeah. it, you could make it useful. somewhat item potent. It still would be useful. Yeah, yeah if you could make the item potent part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, some of it, some of what Drush does is a little hard to do that for. That's why it stopped. Because <laughs> Drush does weird things in certain cases. Like certain commands, easy as can be, other commands, it's like, what? why is it, why is it returning this code and doing this weird stuff? We do not know. Yeah. Is there any other? Yeah. So we use Ansible to manage all of our, um, like all of our AWS instances. But when it comes to deployments, for example, we still use Bower and Jenkins to trigger. And mm -hmm. I remember when we were first getting our Ansible stuff set up, we had a um, a Jenkins job called Ansible Playbook to do a deployment, and I don't remember where it came from, but are basically told that's the wrong approach. So when you're talking about deploying code using Ansible, how do you go, how do you go about doing that? Uh, it depends on. Drupal. Yeah, it it depends on the project, but I I would argue that it's perfectly valid to run an Ansible playbook through Jenkins to deploy code. I mean, yeah. it's it's more about making the process easier, and with Jenkins, it's it's all documented and auditable, which is nice. Uh, the, you can you can get it like you could use Tower to do it or whatever other tool, but um, that's perfectly valid to do that. I I wouldn't you know yeah push back on that one. <laughs> yeah, like, Jack can keep track track of who ran it, when it ran, whether it passed yeah. or not. Like if you're doing things in the command line, that's just gone as soon as you're done well, running like, it. We're firing Jenkins jobs, but the what's in the Jenkins job is triggering our Bower deployment as mm -hmm. opposed to triggering an Ansible for it. Yeah, I mean it's the same thing. <laughs> and, and if, Again, I, I would argue if it's working, if Bower's working and people are happy with it, I wouldn't try to push them to go to Ansible. But if it's a new project and you want to try it, just go ahead and see how Ansible works for you. For for most of what I do, Ansible is great because most of the projects I'm working on, uh, you know, it's it's me or me and a couple other developers. It's not, you know, we're not a huge team, and so we can kind of do whatever we want. And we don't need to have like we don't need real time feedback on our deployment. We just need to know it finished successfully and get a notification somewhere. So um, it depends on your team. It, you know, Ansible is it can be a golden hammer like Drupal, but don't make it that way. You know, it's there are other tools that might be better for your particular workflow. Yeah. I'm curious. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, did you ever um, uh, use Ansible to, to convert a, a Drush make file? into sort of like a Git-centric uh, repository like Gokria has? No, not really. Drush Make is, and Drush Make, by the way, uses YAML too. So 
the world is being eaten by animal, which is, I'm okay with it because it's so much better than weird INI syntax. Um, but anyway, no, I, I, Drush make files, I still keep them as Drush make files. It's, that I think might be an area where like Ansible is not that tool. It could be, but it's, it's not set up for that. It's not as efficient for it in terms of having it all documented easily. Um, but running the Drush make file, yeah, do that in Ansible. Yeah. Specific question. I use um, dictionary items and ansibles for pushing out sites and maintaining sites, people sites. And I have not been able to figure out, you know, how you can loop on a dictionary item for a specific task. Mm -hmm. What I really would like, and I've figured out how to do it in that way, but what I would really like to do is loop on all the tasks in a playbook for each of those dictionary items. And here I have to do these little loops on each task. Item. Yeah. There, there is a way. Well, it, is is the dictionary item like a server name, basically, or just all, a Drupal? All the variables I need for it. It could be okay. a server name. It could be the name of the, the Drupal site. It could be a Git mm -hmm. repository. It could be a database name. Yeah. Sort of so there's a couple ways you could approach that. One is to rewrite your playbook to, uh, or rewrite rewrite the way you do it so that that's an inventory, and then it runs on each server doing that with like the certain tasks. Another way, there's a. This is another one on, on Google Groups. There was a discussion about exactly what you asked. Like, how do you loop? How do you do a loop on a task list? And you can do that. I just don't remember. I think, like, you can maybe include the playbook with with a with a loop on it. Um, I don't remember exactly, but search that on the Google Groups. They'd have a little more. You can include and overwrite variables every time, every loop. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think you can, in a playbook, you can include a list of tasks and then give it a, a, a what is it? I'm saying for each in my head, but it's not, whatever the list is, with items. So you can include with items, and it should, like, do each item with that set of tasks. Try it out and see if it works. If it doesn't, then the Google, the Google groups. So what I'm doing works, but it just... It's clunky. It's clunky. It's, it's, you're, you have duplicate code. When you scale it, so when you scale it, you don't want to run mm -hmm. 30 sites each task yeah. at a time. You want to do a full part of process and then do it the next. Yeah, so. yeah, it's 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 probably one of those two cases. Um, but if you want to email me sometime, email me that uh, email me what you're doing, and I can take a glance at it. So. Is there anything? I think we're getting close to the two o'clock. So. Um, I'll be around. I haven't. Been, I've been to like two sessions so far. So, so anyway, but I love like it's it's awesome. Some of the things I've heard because like I you know I'm writing the book and stuff. I don't have have as much time to look into what other people have been doing. But it's it's helpful to me to see like what are some things that other people are doing that I can you know I don't want to try encroaching on other areas like Drupal VM. There's tens of products that are not products, but like other VMs that do that kind of stuff. So. So a lot of, <laughs> a lot of them like we should collaborate more, or we should push people to a certain one. You know, my environment's not necessarily the best for everyone, especially for teams and things. So, uh, let's keep working on it, work together, and uh, and again, feel free to send me issues and pull requests on GitHub. I try to try to get those through. And thanks. Hey, thank you.